everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Rumcast. This is our first interview episode yeah. of 2022. So coming in with a great interview with someone that I think you probably haven't heard much from before, but you should because he's doing some really interesting stuff all the way out there in Australia. We're going to talk with Justin Bosley, who is the founder of Dead Reckoning Rum, a really interesting new brand out there in Australia. But before we get all, all the way into that, I'm here with my co-host, John Gulla, and we've, we've probably got some catching up to do. John, how, how are things going in your world? What's up right now? Uh, I'm, I'm good. And, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're seeing cases here in Florida less for Omicron. So I'm, I've got a, a bright demeanor. It looks like uh, things good. are in the right direction. So I'm happy about that. And uh, so it's given me a little bit more headspace to explore things a little bit, Will. Uh, and one of those things I've been pondering lately hmm. is a rum-related question that I don't really know if it has a right or wrong answer. Hmm. There are a lot of so, rum-related questions like that, I feel like. I guess so. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, and, th- and this one is rum-related in a, maybe an indirect way. But so I- I'll start off by telling you. Let me start off by saying I mentioned, I think, back in one of our episodes late last year that my wonderful wife surprised me with buying the rum advent calendar again. Yes. But this time it was from a different company than the one I had the year prior. Right. So first of all, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm I'm terrible at keeping up with them each day. <laughs> so you know, it's a lot. It's a lot tougher managing the the rum advent calendar than yeah. like the chocolate filled calendar when you were a kid. You know, it's just you know, one little piece of chocolate. You pop you're it in done, your mouth. Right? You're finished. But right. Yeah, I mean, we, we I feel like we sound a little weird complaining about having to, you know, drink a little bit of rum every day. But it's, it, you know, it's a little tougher to work it in there. Yeah, well, I tried to take it seriously this time. Like, <laughs> yeah. like last year, I was kind of like, just like, hey, boom, try this, done. This year, I had like a little notebook. And, you know, I was trying to really explore with it. Sat down um, in a leather chair. <laughs> it, yeah, right, exactly. With the, you know, the, the pipe, you know, right, no, no, yeah. pipe, no pipe. But um, <laughs> so I don't know if it's just my busy lifestyle or what. But like for the first seven or eight days, I accomplished accomplished this. You know, I had my notes and, you know, wrote things. I did pretty good. I didn't cheat and look forward. Uh, mm-hmm. All my notes were, were, were well organized. And look then I you. guess, you know, like the shit hit the fan at some point in December. Yeah. And I forgot to open them for like 10 days in a row. Mm. So anyway, I've been playing catch up ever since. And well, I finally got through them all at this point. Now, I mean, that's, w- that's almost the, in February. That's the good part. Like, they don't go bad. This so, is true. Right. This there's no true. there's no pressure to finish it by December 25th. <laughs> I mean, the intention is, but uh, this is true. Uh, We do them at your own pace, right? So anyway, I got to try all these 24 samples. And I got to say, at at the end of it, I had this little bit of a meh feeling about the whole thing. Oh, really? Why is that? Well, uh, let me explain, I guess. I think it's more of a collective meh feeling over the last two years of doing this. Okay. Um, So the first year that I did it, I found that the quality of the rums were very good overall. And I, maybe a few I didn't appreciate as much, but I'd mm-hmm. say like, I don't know, maybe two thirds or even three fourths were high quality rums that I enjoyed experiencing. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'd say I also had maybe like two thirds of those rums previously, or mm. I had owned them yeah. or something that was like really close to, to it prior that year. Right. Well, now come to this year in December 2021, and I have to say I was pleasantly surprised because when I got through them all, I had not tried most of them. So this year it was better, you're saying? Well, right. Like less than a third were known to me, which I thought was great. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what you want. You want to be able to discover new things. It's an exploration thing, right? But here's the kicker. More than half of those that I hadn't tried before. Oh, I think I wait. I think I might know where this is going, but but go ahead. They weren't really enjoyable. Oh, Um, okay. I thought maybe they were going to be spiced. So some of them were. Or other ones had clearly had additives in them, mm-hmm. or they just didn't live up to my now ridiculously high standards. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, between those two experiences, I'm kind of like, well, you know, who is this for? And right. I, I guess I think it's great for people that are just starting to explore rums, and I wouldn't hesitate to buy it for them and that crowd. But, you know, for me and maybe those that are listening that are like us, I think I'd rather buy a really great expensive bottle of rum and let that carry me through the holidays at this point. Or, hey, maybe if a company is thinking, is maybe listening to this and thinking about next year already, maybe develop like a rum geek version that has like this very curated selection of rums that are either really new to the market or maybe coming up soon. 
Yeah. So I, I love that, that idea. I, I do anticipate though that if it is put together, it will have a highly curated price. I would say <laughs> to match the selection. <laughs> you know, I I might depending on what it looks like, I might be okay with that. Yeah. Again, because, yeah. Sure. Y- yeah. You know, it just if you and that's the other thing, right? You know, the whole surprise aspect because mm-hmm. you don't know what you're getting. So I get that there's a little bit of that there as well. But you know, for people maybe that are looking for a little bit more of uh, some some things they haven't tried before but also to really get high quality rums i think that's what i want out of it so if if there's one this coming year that looks like it's going to deliver that i'm in if not i'm gonna i'm gonna find me a great bottle and just stick to that in in the 24 days of december yeah i actually i can i can kind of plus one your whole experience there because Mm. i have also had rum advent calendars gifted to me the past mm-hmm, two mm-hmm. Christmases from ah. from my lovely mo- mother-in-law. A very thoughtful gift every year, and I appreciate it. And my, my first experience with it was quite similar to yours. And I do think one aspect of it that can be enjoyable, even if you aren't new to rum, like if you've been in it for a while, is mm. I came across a lot of stuff that was like, stuff that is popular but i'm not necessarily interested in and that i feel like i you know the chances of me like really loving it are probably low but i still find it interesting to be able to try that stuff without having to buy it myself Mm -hmm. you know Mm because i'm probably not going to so just getting to you know taste you know what other people are having and some of the stuff that's popular but Mm -hmm. you know might not be for me is kind of interesting but This year was from the same company and there were a lot of repeats and I would Hmm. say I didn't like go back and count, but I want to say there were like close to like 10 spiced rums in there. There were like (laughs) a lot and I was just kind of like, all right, all right. Yeah. This, this is for someone else. So yeah. Um, well, I don't envy the people that must be doing these because you know how they put those together and their thoughts about how they're doing that. That's got to be difficult, I would imagine. You know, you cannot please everybody, obviously. And and there are lots of fans of different rums, like you mentioned. Maybe sure. it's not for us, but a lot of other people like it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess. I guess uh, we we both uh, weighed in the same on this one. And, we did. Uh, We're in agreement and, uh, here. After our yeah. last episode, where we disagreed on a few uh, different <laughs> predictions for the year. We're, we're more in agreement on this one. so I look forward to disagreeing with you on things in the future. <laughs> yeah, same here. Well, I think on that note, uh, it's a good time to sort of transition over into our interview today. And like I said earlier, this interview was with Justin Bosley. He founded a company called Dead Reckoning Rum that is essentially maybe the first, if not the only, independent bottler right now in Australia. Mm-hmm. And this is a sec- like kind of a topic that's interesting to me for a few reasons. Number one is, as we've mentioned in several past episodes, we're pretty interested in Australian rum. We had Steve McGarry from Ben Lee Distillery on the podcast in the past, and I always see mentions of all these new distilleries out there in Australia that look really interesting. And so just getting to talk to someone who is kind of familiar with the scene there, because Justin, you know, he's doing his independent bottler thing, but he has been to a a lot of those Australian distilleries, talked to them, maybe, you know, potentially doing some stuff, you know, with some of them in the future. Mm -hmm. And so getting a little window into the rum scene over there was cool, but also just the idea of, independent bottlers in places that don't have them is interesting to me. Like we, we talked with Eric Kay of Holmes Key last year, who's kind of part of the new wave of American independent bottlers, not the only one, but certainly one of the more notable of the, mm-hmm. the past few years. And so Justin, you know, might end up being something in that neighborhood for Australia and he's doing some really interesting stuff. So yeah, it was a really interesting conversation. Yeah, I'm just happy also that we're able to start making good on that promise of expanding a little bit and getting some faces and names that are perhaps outside the United States or or even the Caribbean area. Uh, Plenty to come from there as well. I mean, we're not excluding by any means, but nice to open up and hear things about different areas of the world and their rum scenes there and how that differs maybe from different places. So Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed talking with him about all of that as well and hearing his story. Yeah, and he's, he's released, he's done three independently bottled releases to date on top of this he's also been like importing rum from other brands into australia for years now Mm -hmm. so he's he's an importer as well but he's done three of his own releases two of which were blends one of which was a fiji rum from south pacific distilleries uh, that we were actually able to try 
And part of, I think, what got us interested uh, in it was that we thought it was a really good rum. Um, yeah. And in fact, uh, I think it was Wes from fatrumpirate.com mm-hmm. who said it was one of the best Fijian rums that he's ever had. So, uh, you know, that was an indicator that Justin is up to some interesting stuff. But yeah, I think we won't, you know, spoil too much more of the conversation now and just uh, turn things over to the interview. So we are here with Justin Bosley, the founder of Dead Reckoning Rum in Australia. And Justin, I I know that you don't know about this yet, but I actually I wanted to announce and congratulate you on setting a Rumcast record. So a new record for the podcast that has not been set before. You already did it before you even came on the show, which is you uh, you were kind enough to send us a few samples of one of your recent releases. And when the package arrived at my house, you know, it had all kinds of like Australia labeling and stuff on it. And it was at that point that I realized, I think this is the single greatest distance that one container of rum has traveled in one trip to reach <laughs> my house before. And I think it was the same for John. So first of all, thank you for the rum. But second, yeah. congratulations on setting the new uh, new new personal record on the Rumcast for greatest sample distance traveled. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Well, I've set a precedence for your future guests now, haven't I? Uh, <laughs> wink, wink. These guys love samples, so you get them in the mail about a month before the podcast and you'll be in. <laughs> no, just just for the record, we, we, do, we do not require or ask even uh, for samples from our guests, but sometimes but they, they are, are appreciated. Said, yeah, we, we appreciate it. It's, it's great. Uh, and uh, this was a great Fiji rum, so it was nice to be able to taste it. But All that aside, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for being here. And Australia is a really interesting kind of rum area to me and John as well. It's something we've talked about on the podcast a lot. I know there's a lot of new rum stuff popping up there. Um, Actually, when we were doing our year in review episode and kind of like looking back through our listener numbers, I think Australia was in third place in like the most downloads we've gotten as a podcast. So I feel like, you know, Australia has this history with rum. There's this kind of new wave of rum stuff happening there. There's some historic distilleries there, but I'd love to get kind of your perspective on, you know, for us as Americans and for other listeners, you know, who maybe live in Europe or somewhere like that, never been to Australia. What is kind of the the rum scene like in, in general there? And does it, is it similar to other places in the world or how does it differ to you? So look at where we are now. I think if we wind the clock back 10 to 15 years, the Australian rum scene back then was in pretty poor shape. Mm. When I say that, there was probably a couple of distilleries that were putting out some good stuff. Uh, The majority of it was imported. And this was about the time that I came back living from the Caribbean where I realised it was just a huge hole in the market. Like all we had was two distilleries up in Queensland pumping out some rum. Not many small, we'll call them boutique distilleries. Right. You know, the drink of choice back then was a, a rum made up in Queensland, and I won't mention the name, but uh, it was a bit like Vegemite blended with <laughs> methylated spirits. It's uh, it's it's a unique taste. and That's I what I always it. hear about it, yeah, mm-hmm. a unique taste. <laughs> that's that's calling it uh, sort of quite kind, but I don't want to go down that road. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I drank it for probably a good 10 years thinking that's what rum tasted like. It's, it's a little rough around the edges, but... Fast forward the clock now to today. So one of those distilleries in Queensland, which is the oldest running distillery in Australia, is putting out some amazing products. Um, I know you've had Steve McGarry on in the past. Yes. Yeah. He's given you a, a bit of a roadmap as to where they started in the 1800s and mm-hmm. the direction it's heading in now. But four years ago, I think we had about 80 small distilleries throughout Australia. And today we've got over 400 small yeah. distilleries wow so out of those i would probably say that the 30 to 40 that are now making rum mm-hmm. and because of the gin burn so what they did was they made a lot of gin they put their money 
back and reinvesting into brown spirits, into whiskey and rum, to put in barrels. And I think given that the near future, in the next 12 to 24 months, we're going to have an explosion of rum, Australian made, in, in the country, which is a great thing. Wow. Um, whether their quality is up to scratch, right. you know, time will tell. I, I've yeah. been lucky enough to try samples straight off the still three months, six months out of the barrel, and we're definitely heading in the right direction. You know, the, the quality that is, that is there in some of them is just mind-blowing. Yeah, it Australian sounds. Rum, yeah, I was just going to say, kind of that explosion of the the smaller distilleries sounds a lot, kind of like what we've seen here in the states over the past decade or right. so, and just kind of the craft distillery boom and the numbers just you know skyrocketing year after year, and and seeing the growth and everything. And yeah, it's it's interesting because as people turn their attention to rum, you know, who are new to making it, it's kind of a when you have that amounts like hundreds of people trying to do it obviously it's a hit or miss kind of proposition as a rum drinker but you'll find those the 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 handful the the few handfuls of people who are like really dedicated to it and uh, obsessed with rum and really care about it doing some really interesting stuff so that has me really excited to see kind of what we're gonna what more we're gonna see coming out of australia in the next five to ten years yeah definitely australian rum also had a, a very refined taste and i just I couldn't work out what it was after trying, you know, thousands of rums from the Caribbean and then trying Australian rum. It has a very refined taste. That is changing. You know, you look at some of the distilleries that are out there now that are bringing out rum or soon to to bring out, you know, you've got your Beanleys, Husk, Mm -hmm. Lord Byron, uh, Requiem, Yak Creek. You've got Devil's Thumb and Kavu. Now, some of these distilleries have broken the rule book in the way that if I didn't tell you where it was from, some of them you'd say, what part of Jamaica is this from? It is just <laughs> mind-blowing. They're funk bombs. They're using dunder pits. You know, they're, they've broken the rule book as far as what we were doing for the last 150 years in the Australian mm. rum distil- distillery scene, I would call it. So when you say refined, you, you, you mean kind of like, um, gosh, I'm looking for a word that wouldn't sound as pejorative, but something along like a tamer, kind of more mainstream type of rum, and now they're exploring with these more ester counts and different types of flavors coming in. Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, you're 100% correct yeah. there. Uh, refined, uh, smoother would be, uh, you know, Australian rum in the past, like I said, kicks like a mule. It was it was quite a, a ballsy rum that knocked you off your chair, and it was a an interesting taste. But yeah, now it's I quite often use this. What you were handed was a was a cube, and they've refined it to now what 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 we're drinking is a a perfect sphere. They've taken the rough edges off, I and we're getting high esters. We're getting funk bombs. We're getting just amazing quality rums. It's a it's a very exciting right. future for Australian rum. So I I know we want to get into what you're doing now. Um, r- real quick, I want to back up because you mentioned living in the Caribbean a while back ago. So like. A, what were you, what were you doing back then? And and I'm I'm assuming that's kind of how you got into rum was from traveling around over there. But how did you get into rum to such a degree to want to turn it into a career? Yeah, this is a quite an interesting story. Like they say, quite often the journey is uh, <laughs> as much fun as the destination. Uh huh. And it's, it's definitely the case for this. So we wind the clock back 25, 26 years. Uh, I was a an excavator operator in Australia. And it's every childhood dream to, to operate one of these giant machines that's got tank tracks and you can drive over cars and you can dig up a thousand tons of dirt with a single scoop. Yeah. So I, I play with, you know, toys like that with my nephew all the time. So I played with He-Mans. I don't know. I didn't have <laughs> trucks. I was I was with He-Mans and World Wrestling Federation figures. That that was the uh, the profession that I was in. I was I was driving excavators and great fun, but essentially after about four months, you're digging a hole. <laughs> and you're filling it back in again. Yeah. And the next day, you dig a hole, and then you fill it back in again. So <laughs> the, the, the novelty kind of wore off after a little while. Yeah, the, it wasn't so shiny. <laughs> uh, back then, I was probably young, dumb, and full of rum. And I made the decision to start going out with my boss's daughter, which I thought was a great idea. Um, the <laughs> boss didn't. He uh, huh. <laughs> he had other plans. Maybe I wasn't boyfriend future potential husband material at the time, I don't know. He just saw you as another guy digging holes. Well, yeah, that's right. Let's, let's hope he's listening to this now <laughs> and realizes the error of his ways. I'll send him a copy, don't worry. We are in contact <laughs> these days. 
Well, his, uh, his method of sorting the problem was he said, oh, have you ever heard of a town called Woolera? And I said, um, that was a, like a 1950s British rocket testing base, wasn't it? It's about a thousand miles north of the desert. He said, yeah. It's like, okay, uh, what's happening there? And he told me, well, you've got a job there now. It's a six-month <laughs> contract and you're leaving tomorrow. Wow, oh. that's, a, that's a power move. Yeah. That was, <laughs> certainly was a power move. I, I learned my <laughs> lesson. So he, he sent me to this. I, I stuck it out. I did my six months there. Uh, my swing was I worked four weeks on, had one day off, and I did the maths. There wasn't enough time to drive back to Adelaide at all to wow. revisit his daughter. So that was you know my punishment served. What I did was my six months work there and saved a lot of money. And at the same time, I had friends that were in the south of France working on millionaires and billionaires' private uh, super yachts and mega yachts. Oh, okay. Like, mm. as um, one of you guys lives in Miami, I'm sure you've seen them in your backyard. So. <laughs> John's, oh, yeah. actually, John, John's actually on a yacht right now. Uh, yeah, I've got two or three in my backyard <laughs> of those mega yachts. More of those he-men uh, action figures, no doubt. <laughs> that they're full of them right now, yeah. Those are probably worth more than the yachts if they're still in the package. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Well, my friends kept calling me saying, get over here. There's jobs to be had. You don't need any experience. And I didn't need a second phone call. So I booked a one-way ticket to southern France and landed in uh, Cannes, started working in Monaco and Saint-Tropez and Nice, all pretty beautiful parts of the world. Yeah. And with, within a couple of weeks, I'd landed myself a full-time job as a deckhand on a 60-meter-long mega yacht. The deckhands that were on there had done a few Caribbean seasons, and they were Aussies as well. And on about my second day there, one of them, Pete, handed me a, a rum and coke. And back then I wasn't drinking straight rum because you couldn't drink Australian rum straight. It would send you to hospital. <laughs> and he, he passed me a, a cacique and coke, cacique being out of Venezuela. I'm sure you guys have tried it. It's a, an amazing product. And it just blew my socks off in a way that it was the smoothest rum I've ever had in my life. And I thought... What are we poisoning ourselves with back home? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was a light bulb moment. I was like, "Wow, if this what if this is what rum tastes like, I'm in. I'm in." Yeah, boots and yeah, all. yeah, yeah. So that that pretty much started my my career uh, working on super yachts and mega yachts. And I started off as a as a deckhand, scrubbing decks and doing the shitty jobs. But, and then over the over time, you know, I worked my way up the corporate ladder, second officer, first officer, and in the end, I was chief officer driving a 123 meter long, $350 million mega yacht for a, a Russian billionaire at wow. the time. It's a meteoric yeah. rise to the top. Yeah. Yeah. It was a 10 year journey. But th the best thing about working on the boats is we'd do summer in the Mediterranean and you oh, zigzag wow. from uh, Spain, France, Italy, Portugal, down to Sardinia, go to Ibiza for a party, back yeah. to Greece and Turkey. Like it, it was the dream job. That's Unbelievable great. pay. Um, but the best thing was, as soon as it started getting cold in the Met, we would take the boat across the uh, Atlantic Ocean to the Caribbean. And we'd spend six months of the year, every year, for 10 years in the Caribbean. Not and a bad that, strategy. Oh, mm -hmm. man. Like that, that was like a homecoming to me. Then I, I realized just it's one of the coolest, most relaxed, chilled out places of the world that I just want to keep revisiting for as long as I can. But one of my... You know, favorite moments we turned up so we drove the boat from southern spain straight to antigua i think you're at sea for about 14 days you don't see any land you know even that was unbelievable you know navigating a, a vessel across one of the largest oceans in the world well pounding yeah, away at seas yeah. and arriving at this beautiful tropical caribbean island yeah i walked into the first bar and i sat there with one of my friends simo and the barman we were the only two people in the bar and he grabbed a bottle of, I think it was Cavalier. It's a Cavalier. It's a bottle of rum made at English Harbour. Mm. He put it on the bar in front of us. He put two mm. cans of Coke there and he just walked outside and disappeared. <laughs> and, and we sat there and thought, is this a test? Like, is he watching us? Is there a camera? Are we allowed to touch it? And he walked back in about five, five minutes later. He said, well, are you guys shy or something? And both of us said, how much can we pour? And he said, well, how much can you drink? <laughs> and the, that's always a good the response of the, <laughs> the rule of the bar was the rum was free and you only pay for the coke 
So we were just free pouring at the course, oh, making fools of ourselves. But uh, that's quite straight the arrangement. Away I thought, oh yeah, straight away I'm in heaven. This is this is my kind of place. And the bar had fifty bottles of rum on the bar, and in the corner was a dusty bottle of vodka, a bottle of whiskey, maybe a tequila, something that no one ever drank. And I thought, finally, it's like a homecoming. I've, uh, I've, I've arrived in paradise. Hmm. So over those those 10 years that we zigzagged back and forth across the world and spent six months of the time in the Caribbean, you know, we visited, I wouldn't say every island, but I'd probably say 90% of all the islands over there multiple times. You know, I may have visited some of those islands 15 to 20 times over that, that time period. And going further down the rum rabbit hole, you know, at first I was just visiting bars and pointing to every bottle of rum and saying, I want to try that, I want to try that, I want to try that. Yeah. And as time went on, I thought, well, let's start visiting distilleries. So one by one, when we got time off, I'd visit a distillery. And in the end, I'd be, they'd know me that well, I'd be banging on the door, you know, bang, bang, open up, oh, it's closed today. <laughs> it's like, oh, Justin, welcome back, come on in. <laughs> it's good when they know you by first name, you know you're in. What are some of the distilleries that kind of, you know, having been to so many of them, which ones kind of stand out the most in, in your memory of just memorable experiences? I think the life-changing ones were, I would say, Mount Gay. Mm. It, it was another light bulb moment where I realized Mount Gay wasn't being imported into Australia. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, maybe when I leave yachting, I could start doing something like this. Yeah. And that, you know, that, uh, that was a bit of a change for me. Uh, English Harbour was always good because we spent months and months in English Harbour. It's a small place. There's not much to do other than water sports, drinking rum and drinking cocktails and partying, which is, hey, who doesn't like doing that for 10 years? <laughs> Could think of worse, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fast forward a few years, I was sitting in the main street of Barcelona with my girlfriend at the time, who also did yachting with me, who's now my wife. And the main street of Barcelona is called La Rambla. Yeah, mm-hmm. La Rambla. Mm-hmm. And I said to my wife, I think when I get home, I'm going to start importing rum as a job. And she said, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And you were like, ding. That's what you want to hear. Ding. It was yeah. another light bulb yeah, moment. Yeah. And I was like, cool. And by the way, I understand now La Rambla and your company's name for importing is La Rambla. So I'm assuming Made that's the connection. where it from. Uh-huh. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, I, when you're now importing these, I, I'm curious to know, how do you make those decisions as to which of those products you want to import? And then if you can keep talking about, how does that even like start? So you say, ah, I want this rum. What does that process look like from start to finish to get it there? It was an interesting learning curve. Um, so I, I wrote myself a top 10 list of rums that I'd like to import. Okay. And uh, because I had a good rapport with a lot of distilleries already mm, in the Caribbean, yeah. I was in first name basis with them. I just picked up the phone. Hey, remember me? Oh, yeah, yeah. What I did learn was a lot of places had already signed agreements for, we'll call them strategic parts of the world. Mm-hmm. So I, I contacted one company and they said, sorry, we've already signed a deal with someone in Taiwan. I said, well, Taiwan's a long way from Australia. And they said, yeah. no, no. It's an Australasian deal, which encompasses Australia and New Zealand. So right. my list of 10 got out the pen, crossed out number one, next on the list. And as I went down, I found that even a lot of the big companies, you know, like your Diageos had bought out distilleries and essentially bought them out to silence them in a way. So we'll, we'll, we'll say that they've bought a distillery in one country and they'll distribute in three or four countries only. Right. Rather than bringing it in to say... Uh, the US, which they already own another rum company, all right. they're doing is competing against themselves. So right, right. cornering the market. And I learned that that had happened with a lot of large players of distilleries around the world. So number five on my list was a rum out of the Dominican Republic, which at the time I started bringing in was called Cuba Day. Mm-hmm. And they were open to negotiations. They had no one signed up for Australia. So that was the, the first rum that I started importing. And that goes back 11 years now. Wow. I started Im- importing and distributing. So, yeah, interesting journey there, a huge learning curve. So I, I import, distribute, I sell wholesale and retail, and okay. now being an independent bot rack, which we'll get to further down the line, you know. Right. I've definitely got one foot in either side of the fence. You yeah. know, like I, I sort of see everything from uh, importer, wholesaler, and producer these days. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I know just kind of looking through the La Rumbla site, um, I was pleased to see like, all, you know, a lot of really interesting rums and like, you know, some I didn't even expect to see there. Um, like, you know, there mm-hmm. were some of the, uh, you know, bigger named or household name brands that go back a long time. And then I saw, you know, new stuff on there, like Privateer, for example. So are all of those products, you know, listed on the website? Are those things that you are importing into Australia now? I would say 60% of what's on that website is what I import and have exclusivity for in Australia. Gotcha. Uh, and there's other products that friends in the industry uh, bring in to Sydney. And then I look after this particular part of Australia, Adelaide, South Australia, mm-hmm. and vice versa, because I can't be in Sydney every day of the week and with right. global lockdowns. Yeah, we sort of looked after each after each other's territory, which was a, a yeah. pretty symbiotic relationship. A lot of Americans don't, I think, realize how incredibly large Australia actually is. It's like the same size as the United States or even bigger. I don't know. Sometimes when we look at a map, it falls off in the corner of the map for our United States myopic perspective. <laughs> and so we don't see it as a quite that large an area. But I mean, it, it is a huge area and, and a market, I would assume. There's tons of, of uh, places there and huge cities and all that. So it makes sense, I, see, I guess, as you're saying, kind of, you know, how you split it up into to different areas for some of those. It, I was going to ask you also, in terms of before we kind of move into the independent bottler side and dead reckoning, uh, for, for imports, what does success look look like for you in terms of bringing in a new rum brand and i don't mean to get into the dry numbers of it necessarily but like how do you know when you've got something that's working out versus like not and and how long do you give it and all of those type of things yeah i think recognition in the end i think if you start to see it popping up in more and more bars uh, on more rum forums and people just you know going crazy over it then in in my eyes that shows you that you've there's a partial success there. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's not down to bottle numbers. You know, it's not like oh, I've sold 40,000 bottles this year. It, it's not the case at all. Like a lot of the brands that are brought in are, are very niche products. They're, they're single barrel releases or right. small numbers. So I yeah. think for me, success in a product into the country is recognition through rum forums. And most of all, the people enjoying it. You know, what you don't want to see is to pop up on a rum forum saying, I tasted this rum the other day. It's garbage. Don't go yeah. near it. You know that'd be heartbreaking. Luckily, the, the vast majority of what I brought in is it's blown people away. So, yeah, that's that's my view of it. So, so transitioning a little bit into what you're doing now with with Dead Reckoning, I know one thing that John and I have talked about a lot on the show is we kind of we see all these you know incredible independently bottled releases in Europe and everything. And obviously Europe has kind of a long history of independent bottler brands, uh, you know, with great reputations and things like that. The U S that not as much, there's been a little bit of it and they're starting to be more now. So we've been really happy to see um, some of that stuff coming here. And some of those brands are starting to distribute a little bit more here, but I was interested to know, you know, what does that look like in Australia? Is it kind of a similar dynamic where you're not seeing a lot of those great independently bottled releases in Europe? And I'm, I'm assuming there aren't a lot of other companies like yours out there right now, but um, I, I could be wrong. So I just kind of wanted to see, you know, what it's like. Yeah. It's an interesting decision to, to start the Dead Reckoning brand. And one of the main reasons was, there isn't a single dedicated independent bottler in Australia. Mm. I'm the only one. Yeah. When I say that, there are some distilleries that are making their own rum mm-hmm. that have rum in the barrels and they've got to wait two years. Australia having a law that you can't release a rum and call it a rum unless it's been aged for two years. Right. So the stopgap for them is that they've imported some different rums from around the world, put it under their own unique brand and put their foot in the independent bottler world just to cover the stop gap until their product is ready. I've seen distilleries in the U.S. do that as well, um, and and we don't have a we don't have that similar kind of rule. You can sell rum right off the still and call it rum, right. but right. Um, a lot of times, you know, they they want to have kind of like a buffer while they're aging their their rum, so that you know they start importing stuff, and so similar dynamic. It's interesting. Yeah, I take my hat off to them. A lot of places just make gin. And, you know, instant cash straight out the still into a bottle and then it's on the shelf the next mm-hmm. day. But these guys that are dedicated to rum have gone down that route of yeah, the stopgap. Let's get some money in the till and 
in the meantime, you know, they get to bring in some amazing products from around the world as well. Yeah, exactly. So was Dead Reckoning something you had always planned on doing even way back uh, when you came back to Australia? Or was that something then that kind of came about that you were just like, you know what, this is something I, I want to transition and start doing now? Over the last 11 years of importing, I've always thought I don't have enough say on the end product. Yes, I get to choose what I want to import. I don't have any partners or bosses. You know, what I what I want to do, I just go ahead and do it. Mm-hmm. But I never had enough enough say and enough, you know, I, I couldn't really judge the ABV. I couldn't say I want it more funky or I, I want a port or a sherry finish. Yeah. So it was a, a creation out of necessity for me. Hey, can um, you guys send this back, but do 45% ABV for me? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine those requests don't, don't go over well. <laughs> no, no, quite often it comes back with a pretty blunt answer. Right. <laughs> um, and it was a bit of a COVID creation as well. During the first lockdown, uh, which is what, two years ago now, I was sitting yeah. there and I was owed a lot of money from a lot of bars and I was thinking, I'm bankrupt. Like, none of these mm. bars are going to open again. It was a pretty bleak looking future two years ago we didn't know what was the end of the tunnel and i thought well it's potentially game over for my importing business and i may have to start from scratch because that money's gone uh but what i another light bulb moment was why don't i start importing rum from all around the world with the contacts that i made back in my days in the caribbean and from you know amazing companies like ea shear in holland yeah. why don't i start importing from them and independent bottling, you know, start my own label, start aging rums here in Australia uh, in in my choice of barrel, choosing my own ABV. You know, do I want to mm-hmm. bring in a funky rum, a clean rum, uh, a Spanish style, a, a, a Navy style? You know, in the end, it was my decision. And in the end, I wanted to have a lot more say in what was being put in the glass at the end of the day. And that's, you know, what you were describing just now of all the different options and directions you can go into. When, I, mm. when I've talked to other people who, who are independent bottlers, I've always been struck by how difficult a dis- decisions could be like that when you are presented with so many options. Like I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and imagine, you know, if I was working on releasing my, you know, first independently bottled rum, how would I even decide what directions to go in, go in with so many great rums out there? So I'm interested in hearing from you. How did you figure out what you wanted your first handful of releases to be? The first release off the bat was the Sextant. Right. And that was one a, of the blends, of a, right? That's right. That was a four rum blend. Mm-hmm. It was a bit of a homage to my time at sea, you know, uh-huh. 10 years at sea. I was essentially a sailor, you know, it was in my blood. It still is. And I, I looked back through the history books and thought, well, what would a sailor have had back in the day? And sometimes it was just a single cask rum, but I decided to come up with a, a four rum blend, which was a Trinidad, Guyana, Barbados and jamaica Mm -hmm. and it was just incredibly smooth you know i brought that into the country um distributed it through uh, an online rum subscription service called the rum tribe which operates Mm -hmm. in australia it sold out within seven days like oh wow i was thinking i was thinking look am i making the right decision i'm sitting on a lot of product i don't know if you guys are aware but the import excise and duty in Australia is just out of control. Like it's eighty nine dollars a litre. Yeah, I was, I was, you know, I've, I've heard um, rumors or not rumors, but I, I've heard from Australians online of what the prices are like for 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 buying spirits in Australia. And yeah, I mean, just just looking at the the prices on your website, which I know are in line with the prices in Australia, but you know, significantly higher than than what we pay here in the U.S. So I, you know, I can imagine. Yeah, you, you say rumors, but they're actually horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> Our I can, I can the feel world's... the pain coming through the comments, you know, on the, <laughs> the internet sometimes. Uh, yeah, my heart goes out to all of our Australian listeners out there who are still biting the bullet and buying the good stuff. Uh, hats off to you. It's an interesting little bit of history. The reason why our excise is so high is we go back to the first fleet coming in and Australians were... It was a harsh climate and we just survived on rum. You know, there was no creature comforts. All, all everyone did was drink a bottle of rum a day and collapse on the ground and go to sleep. And that was a repetitive cycle for generations. So the Australian government said we have to turn our, our country of convicts 
into clean citizens. Mm. What we're going to do is outprice rum or spirits out of the market. We'll make it so unaffordable that people will stop drinking. Right. Which, <laughs> as we know, people don't stop drinking. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's. It's interesting though. Even though you know we don't have uh, you know taxes that are as high on spirits in the U.S., there's still like so much of how spirits are bought and sold and consumed is still impacted by you know laws left over from like post prohibition era, you know, in the the 1930s and 40s. So it's it's amazing how how lasting the effects can be of uh, you know, policy decisions made generations ago in a country towards alcohol. So I feel like you find that in just about every place around the world in different ways. Completely. And once a government starts reeling in billions of dollars of tax a year, they're never <laughs> right. going to relinquish that, are they? But it's the cherry on the cake for them. Yeah. yeah. So it's hard we, to go back, yeah. If we wind it back to the sextant, I was thinking I'm taking a risk. You know, uh, 300 litres of rum incurs a hell of a lot of excise and duty. Then you buy your bottles, your label designs. I'm like, am I going to be sitting on a thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 investment for a long time and not right. sell it? Mm-hmm. And the, the response just blew me away. In seven days, it was sold out. And That's then huge. The feedback started coming in, you know, the best rum I've ever tried, the smoothest oh. rum I've ever tried. Uh. It was instant recognition for me, yeah. and I thought, it is a success? And yes, it was a success. So but, I knew I was heading in the right direction. By the way, when in, in all your years at sea, did you ever use an actual sextant for finding your way? 100%. Part of a lot of the courses that you do, so I probably spent about six months in a classroom over the 10 years okay. to be able to get a... Uh, promotion to the next level you had to do x amount of sea miles or days at sea mm. and you had to do a course and one of those courses was celestial navigation yeah and navigating with a sextant mm. part of that course was i had to navigate from madeira on the west coast of mm. africa mm. all the way to antigua with only using a sextant nothing oh. else and it was phenomenal you know every day at midday i'd get my zenith i'd have my sextant out you would get your readings. You do about six pages of intense, full on math, math basically. Math, yeah. yeah. I did. Me- I did veggie maths in school. I was terrible at math. <laughs> you know? And there I was, ten years later, doing the most intense five-page calculations to work out an exact location in the world at that given time. It, it had relevance in school. I probably just right. Just you had a, you had a that. reason, a motivation for needing yeah. to to learn it. So so you don't you know end up lost in the middle of That's the right. ocean. <laughs> so on about day thirteen, the captain said, "All right, get up to the bridge. It's four in the morning. Look at your last your last fix on the chart. Where do you think you're, you're going to be?" And I said, "At that heading, at uh, what we're heading, we're heading west at the time." So I gave him a bearing. And I said, in the next half an hour to 45 minutes, you're going to see a red, white, red flash from a lighthouse. He goes, all right, stand here and prove it. So I'm standing <laughs> on the bridge. The sun's just coming up. I can see the red, white, red flash of a lighthouse. And he said, you've just navigated halfway across the world. Wow. And you're exactly, I think I was within two miles of where I thought I was going to be. He ripped off a piece of paper off the GPS and said, double check your, your calculation. And I was bang on. That's amazing. That's great. That's, that's yeah. awesome. That's still supposed to be like the most accurate method for navigating, right? Unless, yeah, the GPS is a lot more accurate, but hey, things break. Um, right. Yeah. Going through the uh, Bermuda Triangle one day, we lost all communications. We lost so, everything. So the, the, the stories are true then. <laughs> well, you heard it, you heard it here <laughs> on the Rumcast, verified Bermuda <laughs> Triangle. As it Confirmed. turned out, it was the uh, U.S. Navy doing an exercise, and they okay. jammed our electronics. <laughs> well, oh, cool. was, now it all I makes know. sense. <laughs> Everything went blank, and we had the engineers of the boat running around going, oh, my God, what's happening? We're looking at fuses. <laughs> We're trying to work it out. And then something printed out the teletext saying, if you're within this geographical area, <laughs> U.S. military exercises are happening, and we will jam you and exactly what happens those damn americans well thank god it wasn't (laughs) aliens yeah better than aliens um no that's that's a really cool part of the story though because i think a lot of times you know there's lot there's many rum brands that in a variety of different ways incorporate you know kind of 
sailing imagery and stuff like that and you know a lot of times it doesn't have an actual connection to the brand right. in any way but for you this is like you you named the brand dead reckoning which is you know a part of the celestial navigation process your first release is called the sextant which you've used before so that's yeah. that's really cool to hear there's kind of like that authentic background to it yeah that was a, a big point for me um, not everyone's lucky enough to have sailed around the world on billionaires yachts and that kind of thing but <laughs> You know, these rum brands created of monsters that come out the deep and finding rum barrels buried in a sand dune and we'll recreate that. But I think that kind of marketing worked 20 or 30 years ago. But yeah, mm-hmm. in, in the transparency of the rum world today, I think you need to have genuine authenticity um, with yeah. your brand and with your story and with your rums as well. So you sold out that release in seven days. And then, of course, you have to do a follow up, right? So you have uh, the, the one actually you sent us as a sample is the Mutiny, which is the second release, which is South Pacific Distillery in Fiji for 11 years, tropical aging, and then finished in six months of cream apera sherry barrels. And before we keep talking about it, by the way, I have to ask, because Will asked, were you a part of a mutiny at some point? <laughs> 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 no, hopefully not. <laughs> but um, Don't want to go up against the billionaires. No. <laughs> well, Particularly... So- Particularly yeah. the Russians. Do not mess with the <laughs> Russians. I've heard that. So anyways, yeah, you sent us a, that fantastic sample from Fiji that's finished in those X cream apera barrels. And I wanted to know about this release. Was it your intention from the beginning to do a secondary maturation in order to kind of make it a unique release there? Uh, or was there like simply this barrel of cream apera that you were just like, oh my God, this is amazing and I have to pour rum in it? Or how did that come together? Uh, that particular race, m- release, Mutiny, um, which was named after a bit of maritime history, again, mutiny on the bounty. So yeah. uh, one of the captains there apparently was an arsehole and used to flog his crew and scream and carry on. And I think after about a year and a half at sea, they've just had enough and they lowered him into a boat with uh, eight, eight dedicated crew and they said, get out of here, and they stole his boat. So there you go. tied back into some real history as well. That was uh, And that was local history, right, to Australia nearby where that happened? Correct. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So that particular race, I imported it from South Pacific Distillery, and it was a giant of a rum. You know, it was it was pretty full on, and I thought it needs a bit of taming. And how am I going to tame this? Now, mm-hmm. instant mm-hmm. easy thing was just add some sugar, but that's one of my things that I'll never want to do is add sugar to a rum. I'm dead against it. I thought, well, how can I get? How can I chisel off the edges of this rum that when I bought it, it was like a cube. I want to turn it into a perfect sphere. Mm. Let's chisel those edges off. Mm-hmm. So the uh, the natural thing was a sherry barrel. It's going to give it the sweetness that I that I need to be able to, to tame it down a little. I don't want to add sugar, but I can extract the sweetness out of the timber out of this beautiful barrel that I bought. So the creamier pair of sherry barrel did exactly that. Um, aging rum in in where I am, in the particular part of Australia, Adelaide, South Australia, we're, I think we're the driest state in the driest continent in the world. Mm. And what that means is our humidity is very low. When you put rum in a barrel here, your ABV goes up. You lose more water molecules than you do alcohol molecules. Whereas if you go to somewhere in the, the tropics, maybe the Caribbean or Northern Australia, it's Miami. the complete opposite. <laughs> Miami as well, yeah. It's quite humid here, yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I spent about six six months down there. It was great. Mm. Yeah, that that's interesting, and I, I think that's something that 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 most rum drinkers don't know about is that you know the proof can go up, and that alcohol you know isn't the only thing that you can lose in the process. I, I call it um, Australian dry aged. You know, mm. essentially, I'm aging it in a desert. And one other place that's started to use this term recently is Beanley with one of their, I think it's a 2015 release, and I think they've. They've put on desert aged on theirs. It's aged ah, in the hmm. on the Riverland. I had a chat to Steve McGarry about that, and that's exactly the they're chasing the same end result. They've, yeah, they've chosen a particular geographic location to get a unique flavor profile out of a barrel. You know, it's it's like putting it in a an oven. It cooks it off extremely fast. So interesting. That's six months in a sherry barrel through an Adelaide summer. So we had forty seven degrees Celsius for some of our hottest days now i think it's like about 115 to 120 degrees fahrenheit i'm not sure but it's way up there maybe even higher Mm -hmm. but the six months finishing barrel was more than enough um that's one part of the job i do enjoy is going down to the the bonded store 
where the rum's being aged, pop the bung and, and tasting my sample every two or three weeks because things change so rapidly. You can't just put it in there and go, I'll get to you in a year. Yeah. Have a taste then. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a rapidly changing flavor profile and I don't want to overcook a product. So that's, that's why it was only a six month maturation as well. It's, it's interesting, you know, hearing about the success of the first release. Like you had this blended aged rum that is like those four countries, that style of blend is like something that I think is a familiar thing for a lot of rum drinkers. Um, it sold out in seven days. And then for your next release, you went in like a completely different direction, um, like kind of out of left field with this this Fiji rum, um, which is great in its own way. But I mean, and I, I know what we're tasting went through that sherry barrel, but even then, it still has some of those kind of like, you know, a little bit kind of wild characteristics, unexpected things that, you know, the the, the average drinker would be a little unfamiliar with. So um, it's, 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 mm-hmm. it's cool that you kind of took a, you know, a different direction with this one. Is, is Was that intentional or was it just kind of you came across this and you were like, this is too good to pass up? A little bit of both. I wanted to educate people by, by buying every dead reckoning product. I want to educate people on the journey as well. So the reason why I went for a South Pacific release, which was completely left and filled from the first, you know, the mutiny South Pacific is 12 years of age. If I didn't tell you, you'd say it's some crazy, funky, off the Richter scale Jamaican rum. It has that very intense white fruits, overripe yeah. fruits, yep. funkiness. It is reminiscent. It's reminiscent of Jamaica. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, a bit like a Hampton or a, or a Worthy Park. So, yeah, a couple of things. One was I had access to the rum um, direct from the distillery. And the second one was I'd like to educate people on a journey. Every release will be different. It's a slightly higher ABV. I had some mixed reviews. Uh, One of them was uh, this was released through the rum tribe again, and and those guys had some some complaints. One guy said, I think it's off. Is it possible that, that this has been left outside? It may have gone off. I've drank a lot of rums in my life, and this tastes like it's off. Hmm. Which wow, I, I would I would guarantee that this this is probably his first ever funky rum. Yeah, uh, you know, you may have been a, an Australian rum drinker up until then, or maybe some a Barna Club. But the big beast that was the Mutiny release, which I call it a big boy or a big girl's rum. You know, it's it's like being I I, I put a a coin next to it saying it's like being punched in the head by an ang- angry Fijian. You know, it's a <laughs> big big rum. It's it's beautiful stuff, but yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot going on in the glass. So the Fat Rum Pirate, which is a, a great reviewer, Wes, uh-huh. on the bottom of his mm-hmm. review, said it's probably one of the most complex rums I've ever had in my life, which straight away, that was my ticket success. Wes has tried thousands right. of rums, and if he's going to coin a, a saying like that, I was pretty happy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I read, I think I think Wes reviewed that rum and the Sextant, I believe, as well. That's right. Um, so yeah, his his reviews were kind of a great a great way to get myself up to speed with what you've uh, released to date. But um, I, I know you, you've also done another blend since the Sextant. And this one, the, the lineup of countries was a little different. And I was really interested to see that this one has uh, some Australian rum in it as well. I think it's Australia, Trinidad, Jamaica, Guyana, and Barbados. And now that you've done two different blends, what do you look for in a good blend? And what is kind of your process for figuring it out and arriving at what you'll eventually bottle? Do you kind of start with a few countries in mind or do you start with a flavor profile in mind and then try to work with with various uh, third parties and stuff to find the right rums for it? What what does that process look like for you? With my many years in the Caribbean and thousands of rum that I drank, one thing I, I have a, I'm not very smart, but I have a very good memory for rum, which mm. is good for my line of work at the moment. <laughs> yeah, you chose, <laughs> you chose the right field. <laughs> so I, I can remember drinking a rum in a bar 15, 18 years ago. And I remember the flavor profile and I'll think, all right, I think that might work well with, we'll say, Jamaica and something out of Trinidad. That was my process for this particular one called uh, HMS Antelope. The reason why I chose those five countries was I went back through the archives as to what you would have been served in the British Navy in World War II. Hmm. At times, it was only three countries. Uh, when rum ran low, they brought Jamaica into the mix. 
and also rum from Queensland, Australia. Oh, so there is a historical precedent, you're saying? There is, 100%. Oh. So none of this is um, airy-fairy made up. The monster came out of the deep and swallowed the boat kind of stuff. It's, <laughs> it's, okay. It's, it's tied back in 100% history books. Now, if we look at um, the rum blending that was going on in Dartford in the UK in World War II, that, it's a pretty amazing story as well. They had, now I can't remember the exact numbers now, a cocktail wonk is going to spank my fingers for not remembering. <laughs> but I think Matt, it was Matt 19, take it easy if you're, if you're listening to this. <laughs> I think it was 19 vats. And some of these vats held anything up to 10,000 litres of rum. Mm. And what they would do was they'd purchase rum from one of those countries, bring it back to the UK, tip it into these vats. These vats were made of timber made of staves wood so it was aging while it was in there and they were in connected with a series of pipes and it wasn't known if they just flowed in amongst each other and created this giant blending mixing machine and essentially like a a solera style of, of mixing everything or whether these pipes came out to a magic pipe in the end where the perfect blend pops out the mm. end that part of the history books isn't known so if anyone from Dartford is listening and knows the answer, please call Dr. <laughs> Wonk. He needs to know. <laughs> that's, that's why I went with this blend. And what I was looking for with a blend as well is you never want one particular distillery to overbear the other. Mm. You want to be able to taste each and every distillery in a, in a sip or in a, in a dram. If you sip something and go, God, it's so funky, it's crazy, well, then you haven't created a successful blend. All you've got is Jamaica hmm. taking over the show. So that's the fine-tuning. Different ABVs from different distilleries and different percentages or portions trying to come out with the perfect end result. So is this is this a pretty long process then from when you kind of start? Do you do a lot of like tweaking, you know, as you were saying, or do you find that you get to what you're looking for fairly quickly? Uh, this one took about... Nine months, oh, wow. months of tweaking back and forth, different variations, different ABVs. Yeah. Sometimes you might get lucky, and on day one, you've got the perfect blend. But mm -hmm. yeah, this, this one took quite some time to, to be able to find that in a sip, you can taste in a different sequence all five distilleries while you've had that dram. And then, you, you know, your long-lasting finish on this one, for me, is your Australian rum is just sitting on your back ballot. So mm. I thought I've, I've achieved what I was after. Hmm. So this one as well, the, the latest release, which is called HMS Antelope, I named it after my grandpa's destroyer that he was on in World War II. Oh, wow. Um, I wanted it to tie back into not only real events, but some history. And especially for me, this is family history. So it's, uh, yeah, you know, it means even more to me. So this was a uh, destroyer that he served on from 1939 to 1945 uh, oh, wow. at the yeah. UK. And I remember his stories growing up as a kid. You know, we used to go to the RSL, which is the return servicemen's league, where mm. uh, all expats sit around and eat beautiful home cooked meals from their wives out the back cooking and play snooker and darts and, uh -huh. and tell stories and drink rum. I thought I'd love to be able to create a rum that pays homage to not only my grandpa, that was a sailor for that time, but to all sailors. You know, they did it for king and country, you know, they. They went against the odds. They just reading the, the history of, of what he had to go through on that boat over the 39 to 45 is just insane. Yeah. You know, dodging torpedoes, getting strafed, the Germans, a constant attack. It was the first destroyer to single handedly sink a German U boat in history. Wow. Collided mm. with battleships, escorted the British uh, battleship, the Hood, to find the Bismarck, which was the biggest, badass, badass battleship in the world. And my grandpa told me a story. They escorted the hood out into the Atlantic and did a turn to port and moved about 10 miles away. And then the hood was hit with one shot, which hit it in the powder room, which is where, where all your ammunition is. And the boat blew to a million pieces. There was only wow. three people that survived. Oof. But this battleship just disintegrated in front of their eyes. Incredible. It's just crazy history. So, yeah, I wanted to give homage to my grandpa and... All, all the sailors out there, all the vets. Well, I, I mean, it sounds like an amazing blend and uh, looking forward to that one very much. 
shifting back a little bit to talking about the rum scene in Australia a little bit, you mentioned earlier that there is the, the high taxes there in Australia for rum, and that's a difficulty for importing. Are there other big challenges to creating your brand like this in Australia or any sort of unique obstacles that independent bottlers in other parts of the world wouldn't face? I would think the minimum age requirement would be the biggest hurdle. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, you mentioned that. So there's there's nothing, no unaged rum there, or do they? H- how does that work? You can buy an unaged rum. It's called a cane spirit. Okay. You can't have the word rum on the label at all. You can sort of slide under the radar and bring something out there. Importing unaged rums into Australia is a different story. The Australian customs, are, they're intense. They're ball breakers. So if I try and import something that's unaged, they'll simply impound your product. You just can't get it through customs. So, so wow. I, I don't, I don't know if this relationship would be possible. But let's say you brought in something like Ray and Nephew, they would just sit on that and not let you have it. It's interesting. That's just been started to be brought in about six months ago. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Now there is, there is a, what we call it a a loophole in the system, and you can slide under the radar. Now, I believe the product over here is called Rum Bar Rum mm-hmm. from Worthy Park. Worthy Park, yeah. Worthy Park, that's the brand name. But nowhere else on the bottle does it have the word rum. Ah. So you're drinking a rum bar rum, and it may have cane spirit written on the bottle somewhere in very small writing. Interesting. So hmm. You're not bringing in a rum, you're bringing in a cane spirit. and You're not calling it a rum, but your brand name just happens to have the, the word rum in your brand name. So That's there's a little loophole. <laughs> could could you see that that law ever changing at any point, or do you think it's too too established? I believe that it's been put forward to Parliament for some changes, but as we all know, talking to a politician is like banging your head against the wall. You're <laughs> full of promises, and you you may not get an end result. Right. Um, from what I believe, this law was introduced in the early 1900s by Bundaberg Rum up in Queensland to protect their own rum industry. So people didn't bring in cheaper products and sort of cut them out of the market. Right, mm-hmm. right, right. Mm-hmm. So sp- speaking again, we we talked a little bit about kind of the uh, Australian rum scene earlier and the sort of the proliferation of all these new distilleries popping up. Um, I'm interested just what to you when you look across the landscape, like what are a few under the radar distilleries or things happening right now in Australia that all, all of us people outside of the country may not know about, but should kind of keep our eyes peeled for? Is there anything that you'd recommend? I think if you look for, well, Beanley, I believe, has got some amazing products in the works. Yeah. Um, you're lucky enough to get that, I believe, somewhere in the US, definitely in Europe. I, I know that they've got some pretty amazing products in barrels, and I can't wait to see what comes out in the future there. Yeah, John and I are um, both uh, both big Binley fans. Yeah, so. yeah. I think another one is Kabu Distillery. Kabu. Now, Kabu is essentially running the Jamaican, not business model, but model, Dunder, Mark, mm-hmm. Iester. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They haven't released a product yet. Um, okay. They, they've released a Cane Spirit, which I've tried and is amazing, but I think watch out for them. They are going to rewrite the rule book as far as Australian rum. You're going to be oh. drinking things thinking this has got to be from Jamaica. You know, I mm. really look forward to seeing what they've got. Some of the swallowing suit will be Devil's Thumb Distillery from far north Queensland. Very much similar using Dunder and Muck, Iester. Um, I think I, I feel like I've seen one or two distilleries that are growing sugarcane over there as well and, and doing like a, a fresh juice rum. Correct. Husk is one. Yeah, so they. A, mm. It's a it's a field to steel operation. Uh huh. Their their cane field is fifty meters out their back door. Huh. You know that's awesome. Cool. They're, they're yeah. cutting and just banks crushing, and uh, and putting it through the steel that day, which is great to see. Most of Northern Australia is full of sugar cane. You know, I think we've got, if you worked out how many acres of sugar cane there is, it's probably the size of the UK four times over. Yeah. You know, wow. We grow a lot of sugar cane. Hmm. So it makes natural sense if you've got sugar cane in your backyard. Hey, let's turn it into rum. Why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or or cane spirit as well. <laughs> cane or spirit. cane spirit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever considered uh, bottling a, a domestic rum or cane spirit? It's definitely on the cards. It's I would say sometime next year there'll be something coming out. I won't I won't lead into it anymore, but it will be. It may be a rum. It may be a cane spirit. I'm undecided on that yet. It all depend on. Um, the tasting that I'll be doing in the near future with, with these distilleries. 
Very cool. Well, either either way, wh- whatever it ends up being labeled, the, the the real rum fans out there will know it's rum. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Correct. I was gonna say, if you need help deciding, Justin, we're only a half a world away. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and quite conveniently, my brand name is Dead Reckoning Rum, so I I could just call it a cane spirit down the bottom, and there's a little yeah. loophole there as well. There you go. Yeah. Take yeah. advantage of that loophole. Yeah. Exactly. So, so beyond that release that's kind of in the works right now, uh, what else you know should people look out for 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 Dead Reckoning in the in the near term future? Any other any new blends, anything like that coming up soon? Yeah, there's I've got just over three thousand liters in barrels now, so wow. we've got some really interesting releases on the horizon. We've got some stuff happening in Europe and New Zealand with the brand being released there as well. Oh, very cool! In about April or May this year. Dead Reckoning will be released in Europe via Left Hand Spirits. Oh, and I know you've, cool. Our, our friend Knut. Knut. Yes, I believe you've had him on. It was a really good podcast, that one as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, so that'll be in Denmark, Luxembourg, Holland, and France. And there's more countries to come. It's um, Left Hand Spirits will be uh, busily trying to sell out what I've got there. And interestingly, that'll be a 20-year-old pot still run out of South Pacific Distillery. Ooh. The reason wow. I've gone for that is it's the oldest rum ever to come out of that distillery i was gonna say 20 20 years is that that, that sounds pretty high up there for a fiji rum it's crazy it makes mutiny taste like cordial like it's (laughs) it's full on (laughs) um that'll be released to cast strengths as well which i believe is 69 percent that is definitely uh, a big boy's rum yeah um that'll be called the sleeping giant because that big giant has been sleeping for 20 years. <laughs> I was and finally, <laughs> been sleeping I was for a long time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I haven't asked what the angel share would be. Now, the angel share for mutiny was, I think, 50%, around wow. about that, 55%. Mm. The sleeping giant, they only had 200 liters left. Wow. So, they're, you know, we're probably looking at 85, 90% Ooh. angel share. It's, it's crazy. Mm. Absolutely crazy. It was time to wake it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Angel's got to stop being so greedy. I know. I know. (laughs) There'll be another release simultaneous in Europe as well. Uh, That'll be a 10-year-old South Pacific rum that's come out of a musket barrel, and that is just phenomenal. The musket is rounded off the edges. It's got that port, fortified wine, Mm. smoothness to it. It's silky. It's it's amazing. Um, I really look forward to seeing the... The, the response we get out of Europe with those two releases. Uh, New Zealand as well. I'm um, releasing in New Zealand next month via 8 p.m. Spirits, and those guys will be taking on the um, HMS Antelope, which is good. Nice. That's only, that's in our backyard. But um, yeah. one of the next releases, which will be in Australia only, and I'm very excited about this one, is a MOBA 2017. Oh, uh, there you go. It's a heavy char red wine cask finish. Are you doing the the finish on that? No, it's been 100% aged in Africa, South Africa. Okay, got it. Gotcha. It's this was another light bulb moment. You know, I've had a few in my run world. One of them was trying that Kasike many years ago, mm-hmm. handed to me by one of the deckhands. And then another light bulb moment was I tried Hampton for the first time and thought, mm. my God, like what is this? <laughs> and that that rewrote my run rule book as well. I thought. This is this is real rum. Like this is got so much happening. And the MOBA, the people have asked me describe the flavor profile. But I'm still struggling to put down adequate tasting notes. It's and MOBA. It, it's, <laughs> it's it's mind blowing. I don't know if you know that smell when it's been really dry. It's a summer's day. There's rain coming, and you get that smell of the rain hitting the dirt that mm. sort of comes through. It tastes like that. It's very hard to describe, but it's mm. it's an earthy. Plus, it's got so much more going on in the glass. You know, it's. I really look forward to that release. That'll be, I would say, in about four or five months in Australia. Awesome. I haven't chosen the ABV yet. It'll be something quite high. And then what I've got aging here in, in Adelaide is a lot of rum. I've been warned by my wife to, to slow down and stop buying. You know, it's just <laughs> too much. Like a lot of people have got problems of buying rum and putting it on their bar, but. Uh, yeah, this is a whole new level. I just buy in bulk instead. <laughs> so I'm I'm allowed to tell my wife, Justin, that you have 300, three, was it 3,000 liters of rum? And I can say, hey, look, Justin has 3,000 <laughs> liters. I've just got this, you know, a few hundred bottles. So like, 
you know, the, the difference is he's planning to sell it, John. Oh, you know, <laughs> details. He's details, not drinking at all. Details. Yeah, tell her that. It'll, it'll clear the path. No worries. So we've got worth a try. We've got a hell of a lot of rum from Barbados, namely from Foursquare. I've but heard of them. Yeah, they're a pretty good distillery. <laughs> we've got five, six hundred liters, aging in a sixty-year-old port barrel from Sepulsfield uh, Winery, which is in the Barossa Valley, oh. which is a very famous uh, wine region. That's one of my draw cards. I've got the Clare Valley, Barossa Valley, and McLaren Vale all within 40 minutes drive. Very cool. You know, so I've got access to four or 500 different wineries right. and their used casts as well. Mm-hmm. Makes my job easy. I can, I'll go to a winery, taste what came out of the barrel, make an educated decision whether I want to go down that route, then buy the barrel and put rum in it. So yeah, we've got a, got a port cask release coming out. Uh, we've got a wow. Merlot yeah. cask. Barbados. We've got a PX Sherry cast release. Uh, I couldn't make up my mind up with another one, so I've just put it in a um, X Makers Mark Level 3 Char Bourbon barrel, and that'll just sit there for however long it needs to, probably years. It, is, it sounds like you've got a lot of reasons yeah. to be taking these trips to, to go and you know sample as much as possible, right? You get a lot of stuff to check up on. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and popping a lot, of, a lot of bungs on barrels as well. You know, it's a great job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, because I've spent so many years in, in Antigua, in, um, in English Harbour, I've got a Antigua release coming out as well. Oh, awesome. Um, that barrel that had the mutiny in it, I've now put Antigua rum in that oh, premium cool. pair of sherry barrel. That'll be interesting. Mm-hmm. It will be because it's, it's actually picked up a little edge of funk. Yeah, out I of the mutiny that. that was in there. Mm-hmm. And I've also put some Antigua in a Oloroso barrel. And I might do something unique there. I might bring out a double release in 500 mil bottles and you'll get it as a package. Oh, that so would that be way awesome. You've got, I, I don't believe anyone's um, ever done that before. And they, they're tasting like completely different rums, as they should. Yeah. Um, so you'll get a, a one liter pack, two rums from the same distillery in different barrels tasting completely different you know yeah it'll be a more of an education piece as well which like i said i want to educate people i love that idea yeah Yeah. i I wish more people do that so i'm glad you're doing that to hopefully spur that on more because i think that's a great idea to do either the 375 or the 500 ml sizes and you get to try that and do a side-by-side comparison that whole thing just appeals to me very much so so it seems like a really cool idea i did hear luca mention that he had something in the future and he put the same rum in three barrels in the same aging warehouse, but just in different locations. Mm, one up yeah. high, one down the bottom and one in the back corner. Right. And he said they're completely different rums and he was probably going to do something similar. And that was like the light bulb bang. Hang on. I want to try something. Yeah. The same, mm. just with slightly different barrels. I, I like when I when I asked you kind of what you had going on, I thought maybe you'd have like a couple of things here and there. But man, you're you're doing you're going in like all these different directions. That's if if I were an Australian right now, or um, I suppose in one of those markets in Europe or New Zealand where you're going to be pretty soon, I would be pretty excited about all of this. Heck yeah, an explosion for real. Yeah, and oh, Justin yeah. Bosley is uh, behind it. <laughs> I, I, I'm excited. That's for sure. Well, um, Justin, thanks for, for taking the time, uh, waking up early in the morning tomorrow. It's, we're in two different days right now. It's crazy Yeah, to, to chat with us and, and tell us about what's going on in the Australian rum scene and everything. But before we go, we do have a tradition on the rum cast. It is a, a segment run by my co-host, John Gullah, called the Rapid Fire segment, where he puts your feet to the fire and drills you on a series of increasingly bizarre questions that you must answer as quickly as possible. So if you're up for the challenge, uh, we'll, we'll move on to that now, if that sounds good to you. Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And it's, it's 2022, Justin. So we've got a, a little bit of some new standards you're going to kick us off for this year. So we'll have a, a little bit new to start with. Some, some old, some, some you'll recognize and some new stuff. So yeah, this uh, is our first of the new year. Yeah. So uh, you're kicking it off for us. So Will, when you're ready... All right, I've got 60 seconds, and go. All right, neat or on the rocks? Neat. Column, pot, or blend? Tough one. I'll go pot. (laughs) All right, molasses or cane juice? Molasses. Okay, for aged rums, do you prefer aging under five years, five to 15 years, or over 15 years? 
Ooh. I'll break the trend. Eight years is my sweet spot here. Ooh, so, I like okay. it. I like All it. right. <laughs> All right. Your favorite cask finish or secondary maturation? Sherry. Okay. Dead reckoning is a term for a technique that was used in maritime navigation a long time ago, as well mentioned. Will the next brand you launch maybe be called GPS Rum? Or maybe maybe start a company, Global Positioning Spirits? I love it. Hang on. I'm going to get a t-shirt that's made now. <laughs> don't, don't, don't run into that idea so quickly. I'm not sure about it, Justin. <laughs> Your favorite person, Justin, to share a bottle of great rum with? Uh, my wife. She's got a educated palate, probably more than me. Only nice. fair since she started you on this journey that long ago, as you mentioned. One hundred percent. If you're ever able to purchase your own mega yacht due to the success of Dead Reckoning Rum, what would you name it? Ooh, slightly sideways. <laughs> okay, I like that's it. time. All right, let's, that was good. That was good. We got through. Good, some good, good job there. thinking of a name on the fly. Those kinds of questions are always difficult. Slightly sideways. Yeah. That's slightly good. Slightly sideways is a good alliterative <laughs> name for a mega yacht. I like it. Yeah. Except, except you don't want to actually be slightly sideways in the ocean, right? As long as that's not happening. That's right. As long as I'm slightly sideways and whoever's and, drawing and the it boat is not. They're, they're <laughs> there, you <way> go. <laughs> there you go. I love it. That's great. We'll put that on a t-shirt as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, thanks again, Justin. And uh, before we go, any anything else you wanted to share that we didn't get a chance to talk about? Um. Look, I really look forward to the future. Like I said, I didn't even go through all the releases that I've got. There's a lot happening there. Yeah, I've got a problem. I buy too much rum. <laughs> I look forward to releasing it. I really look forward to trying to find a distributor in the US. You know, that's that's a real future goal. Yeah. It's a different kettle of fish over there because you've got essentially a distributor for every state. But, um, it's like 50 countries, basically. <laughs> I know. It's a hard one to crack. Yeah. Uh, just watch out for Dead Reckoning. And I hope in five years it's a global brand. and. I look forward to when the world reopens up, which we're not far away. I can I can have a rum with all these rum enthusiasts and distillers yeah. and, and great people around the world. Yeah, you're hopefully, always welcome here. Yeah, yeah, hopefully our paths will cross uh, someday soon. They definitely will. All right, so that was our interview with Justin Bosley from Dead Reckoning Rum and La Rumbla Imports. Really, really fun to talk to him about his entire journey, how that led him to where he's at now, and then to hear the amazing amount of things to expect in the future from him. So, Australia, get excited, because, yeah. uh, wow, you've got a lot coming your way, and uh, hopefully other parts of the world will get to experience that as well. We, we're just uh, appreciative of that conversation and hope you enjoyed it as well. And if you did, make sure you spread the word. Let, uh, let other rum geeks out there know that are like you that this exists and get them information on uh, all the things going on across the globe for the rum scene and uh, maybe uh, you know find us on social media as well and uh, give us a, a little like or a comment on, on your perspective as well so Will wh- where do they go on social media to find us and, and so they can talk about Wow things. you're turning this around on me in the new year so uh-huh. John, John is sort of our social media master but I believe we are at the Rumcast on Facebook at the that Rumcast on Instagram. You can find us on YouTube, Twitter as well, and you can also email us host at rumcast.com. That's h o s t at rumcast.com. Let us know what you're excited about, what you're looking forward to, what you're drinking right now, and any questions, comments, ideas you have. We always love to hear from you. So give us an email, give us a like, give us a comment, give us a DM. There's tons of ways to reach us. We're very available. and We love to hear from you guys. So We're sliding into the DMs with exactly, everybody. <laughs> exactly. It's not a problem. So anyway, on that note, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Check out the show notes for links to everything Justin has going on. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>